Hello, this is National Master Spencer Feingold back at the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of Atlanta. Today with another great players of the past. This time we're talking about Miguel Nydorf. Who's heard of Miguel Nydorf? No one? About half of you, it seems. Yes, Nydorf was a, uh, a great player of the past. I mean, how else to put it, right? You can read right here, he's a Polish Argentinian chess grandmaster, originally from Poland. And it says he's known for the Nidor variation, one of the most popular of all chess openings. That's very true. I think, I feel like it should say Sicilian defense somewhere in here, don't you think? Known for the Nidor variation of the Sicilian defense, something like that. Come on, what are you doing? Anyways, uh, yeah, you can read about his life here. Um, yeah, see, he was tutored by Tartakauer. Yeah, I bet you didn't know Tartakauer's first name really started with the letter K, did you? <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep, that's how it goes. And uh, let's see, he moved to Argentina. He was good at blindfold chess. Yes, that's right. He set many world records. It says so in Wikipedia, and that's even true. So it's one of the few true things on Wikipedia. He was a world champion contender, but, um, come on, he wasn't going to win. Yeah, he had some good tournaments. He beat, like, all sorts of top players. We'll see him beat Fischer, Spassky, and Keres. I tried to pick some of the games that uh, weren't in his, like, notable games. Oh, uh, here they are. All right, this one, though. I like that one, so I picked it anyway, but I missed all the other ones, so that's good. Personal life here, yeah. So, all right. I was told I had to show the Wikipedia, so I did. Now let's look at his games, huh? First game, like I had already mentioned, against Paul Carres. Now, I thought it'd be too easy to show games where he played like a Night Dwarf Sicilian, right? So, all these games, he actually has white. And I wanted to emphasize that Night Dwarf was a very interesting positional player. You know, he, he didn't mind to attack your king, but he, he liked to make the position uh, unclear strategically. You know, who, who knows what the right plan's supposed to be and, and how to execute it. And, and you know, you're going to have to find some good maneuvers to keep up with his understanding as well as calculation. So he liked to really make the game very complicated and, and unclear. Not necessarily, like I said, playing for mate, but playing for complications. Let's take a look. So he's playing Paul Carez. And this game was... Check my notes here at 39, 1939. So pretty early game for Nidorf here in his career. He goes for e3, which is a sort of an anti-theoretical move. You know, he's trying to avoid some main lines. Maybe Keres was known for pushing some theory forward. So he figured I don't want to test the guy. Interesting play. And he goes for a G6, which I gave a lot of other options here because uh, G6 is pretty solid, but it's not to everybody's taste. Like if you're a Slav player, you don't always want to fee and cuddle your bishop. So you've got bishop F5, E6, bishop G4, or A6, all reasonable moves that you can play depending on which variation of the Slav you play. Like if you play the A6 Slav, you'll play A6 here. Why not? Right? Um, if you play like the mainline Slav with DC and bishop F5, you could play bishop F5 here. Or bishop g4 if you like to get out your bishop that way. Um, but you'll probably have to give up the bishop pair in that variation, so you're going to have to be okay with that. So you've got a lot of options. g6, you typically don't see black going for a fianchetto in a slav like this. Because if you go into an exchange slav, you don't always want to play g6, bishop g7. That's not the best square for the bishop in that pawn structure. The bishop's better on this diagonal in an exchange slav structure. You know, rather than this one hitting there. So, um, black would accept that if white were to capture on d5, but white has accepted a minor deficit himself, right? His bishop's blocked. It wouldn't be on f4, which would be the perfect square for an exchange Slav. So yeah, it makes a lot of sense to go for a, I guess this would be a, a Schlechter Slav. Is that true? Probably. Bishop d3. Most people prefer to put their bishop on e2. For example, knight c3, bishop e2 is the most common way to go. I think it makes a lot more sense, and it's a, the best try for an advantage. 
I don't like to put my bishop on d3 when they fee and cut out, unless there is some really specific reason to do that, which maybe there is. But, um, well, I think, you know, knight of is just winging it, basically. It doesn't end up mattering too much, because, as we'll see, Keras makes, I think, uh, a poor decision here. He goes for dc, gains the tempo <clears throat> on the bishop there, no doubt about it, but obviously gives away some space in the center. And um, I think it's not really in the spirit of the Schlecht or Slav. You know, in, in this variation, you typically keep the pawn on d5 and, unless you have a very specific reason to uh, to take on c4, which maybe you do. But yeah, here I think you can avoid it. And this position has occurred in practice several times, and I give some other options. a6 again, as well as bishop g4. Like, don't you think bishop g4 makes a lot, a lot of sense when they play bishop d3 instead of e2? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think so. And okay, again, a6 is interesting. It's like what Komsky would do here. But okay, takes it. Not the end of the world, but white is going to have a little bit more space here. You can't argue with that. Knight bd7. I also thought maybe bishop g4 was playable here, but Keres doesn't want to give up that bishop pair, so he avoids it. And uh, goes for bishop, I'm sorry, queen e2. Sort of a normal looking move. I think more direct would be e4 though. I mean, look at that center. Pretty nice. That's the problem with playing d takes c4, as black did. <coughs> it gives away control of the e4 square. So for example, if this did happen, maybe bishop g4, trying to put a little pressure on d4. But uh, I think white would be pretty happy here. You know, he's potentially going to get the bishop pair because black is basically uh, uh, black is basically guaranteed that he's going to play bishop takes f3 and give up the bishop pair. And he also is going to have more space with white here. So white should be a little bit better in this kind of position, I would imagine. But he goes for queen e2. Probably not the best move, but I think the only way for black to play for equality would actually be a somewhat unusual move. But maybe some of the players in this audience would play it, actually. Black to play. What, what would be some candidate moves, maybe? <coughs> what? Oh, nothing there? <laughs> I, thought you had, oh, I thought you had an answer for me, sorry. It could just be candidate move, it doesn't have to be uh, the best move, I only criticize it mildly. You know, <laughs> that's all. Come on Oliver, help him out, he can't even find a, he couldn't buy a move here. <laughs> I like my four. What, what did you say? Knight, uh, knight b6. Knight b6. That's what I said. Interesting move, definitely. Attack. Reasonable move. Let's try to out. Definitely, right? Attacks. I think that move makes a lot of sense. Attacking the white square bishop is pretty reasonable. Mm -hmm. Now, generally, I like to think about. Oh, did you have a candidate move? B5. B5, also attacking the bishop. Mm -hmm. Forcing moves. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess knight b6 doesn't threaten to win material, but I don't think white would like you to play knight takes bishop and, and lose the bishop pair for white there. So either way, you would be attacking the bishop and, and inducing it to move away. But why would you uh, care about that? What if he just plays bishop d3? Either way. You know, b5 or knight b6, bishop d3. Yes? The bishop is able to develop. The white square bishop on, on c8? Yeah. So you're going to go to like b7. Yeah. That's pretty okay. Or f5 if my Right. Well, probably he... Oh, I was... You know, I wanted bishop d3 anyway. So you could still play bishop f5 if I play bishop d3 and let me double the pawns. That's not a ridiculous idea because you control e4 pretty well in that structure. You know, for, for I'm just saying, for example, this, that, there... If I took, which I'd probably just play e4, not take. But if I took takes, I wouldn't be so bad for black. I think I would pop e4 if you played bishop f5 there. 
Now, why is that not so bad? Because that's when he has That to structure? Play. Yeah. Well, I, it's important to control e4. Oh, okay. You know, that, that's a really important square because it's making this bishop bad that you can't play e4. That's why I wanted white to play e4 even earlier. Oh, I see. So it allows you to control e4 so that overrides the bad. Well, you're, you're sacrificing your, your structural integrity on the king side. Yeah. But in return, you're getting uh, some peace activity. Or that is to say, you're limiting your opponent's peace activity. So you're getting an advantage in peace activity as compensation. <laughs> but yeah, that kind of stuff happens in the Slav quite often, actually. I would say, that structure. Or even e takes f. Oh, what happened there? Yeah. Come on. Sometimes you'll see e takes f for the same reason, to control e4. But I like to think about, I was actually going to mention this, I like to think about my pawn breaks, right? Pawn breaks are where it's at. And Karius made a move to prepare one of his pawn breaks. It's not a great move. He played knight e8. Backing it up. Really passive move by Keres there, but clearly preparing, clearly preparing. F5? That's not a pawn break. Well, you said preparing. E5. Oh, E5. Pawn oh, break. I, well, I know, but I thought you were, for some reason, headed for the E3 pawns, and it's a two move. Oh, I get so you. Was, F5, yeah. F4? Yeah, but I didn't quite see why, but okay. Yeah, e5 is the pawn break he's going for. Um, That's why he played knight e8. The bishop defends e5. Oh, the bishop. The bishop. Discovered defense? Oh, I see now. Attack, maybe? I was trying to figure out what Yeah, that's what he's up to. Okay. But knight e8's a pretty weird move, you know, if, if it's not, uh, if it's the only move, then maybe, but I actually would like to knock the bishop off. If I get it off this diagonal, that would make e5 even safer. Because e5 is going to weaken that diagonal. You can't play e6 anymore. So that's why b5, as suggested by Mr. Archer, uh, correct move, absolutely. If we back it up, I looked at both ways of going. If we go back this way, we can prepare e5 here, and it's a little bit safer. Now, I would normally want to play this way with black because it's, it's pretty weakening of that c pawn, right? You gotta watch out for that kind of stuff in the long term. And Karaz is super solid, so he probably considered to play like this, but or even if Bishop B3, to keep pushing it. We've got this idea. Look at these arrows I made. See those arrows? B4 followed by Bishop A6 skewer. That, you know, a little bit of tactics. I mean, you could do a lot of stuff to get out of that, like Rook D1. Rook D1 is fine. Bishop C2, so that you can answer Bishop A6 with Bishop D3. So you've got a lot of ways out of that, but he can get some initiative on the queen side and actually play maybe even for c5 if you have to move your knight back and you can't win this pawn. And I can get in c5 without losing the pawn. That'd be really nice. But okay, that's kind of asking for a lot. Hopefully it'll happen. And yeah, instead 98, a little bit more timid. A little bit more timid of a move. Definitely lets Nidorf uh, seize the initiative here. Great play here by Nidorf too. He knows e5's coming. He can't even really prevent it. He can't control it again. I mean, he could make a move like, you know, bishop e6, x-clam. <laughs> that, that would prevent it, but not in, in a logical way. So he, he lets the guy do it. Nice improving move here. Bishop b3. He wants definitely to keep the bishop on that diagonal because he knows e5's coming, which is what happened. But he handles this really nicely. He doesn't want to get an isolated pawn on d4, so he first of all snaps it. But now, I mean, doesn't it look pretty equal? You know, the knight on e8 makes a, an unusual impression, but what about the bishop on c1? That's pretty bad. What did Nidorf do here to start the initiative. What do you think? Attacking that bishop, huh? So bishop g7? 
B4. What's your idea there? To attack on the kids. Really good stuff. I think it's pretty clear white has to attack on the king side here, right? Because of the pawn structure. He's got four pawns on the king side against three. Now, if you're watching this at home on YouTube, hello. <laughs> but you've got to check out, I'm trying to remember who it was, Zuckertort. The Zuckertort great players of the past. Where he also had the same stru structure. He had four pawns. <clears throat> against three on the king side against Chigorin. This is, I think, the first game I showed. And Chigorin had three against two on the queen side. Although his two pawns were actually split. And um, just ran him over on the king side. Ran him straight over on the king side. And yes, he advances in the center as well while doing this. This is really nice. Very good play here. F4, E4. Absolutely right. Advance on the king side. He's got ideas for days here. He can block the bishop with e5. He can break with f5. Four against three. Push the pawns, gain space, no trade. Right? No trade. And this is why um, Keres made what might be considered a controversial move. But I think it's actually not bad at all. Check this one out. Bishop e6. Interesting defense. I think I gave it interesting there. Yeah. Interesting defense. And, uh, well, it, it accepts a bad structure, right? You know, there's no doubt about it. If it takes, um, he's just going to recapture. And he split his pawns there. But as far as defending four against three, it's not so bad to have this structure for black. You know, it makes it difficult for white to break and make a passed pawn. And he's controlling this pawn break really well. The black rook and pawns doing a good job controlling white's natural break there. So bishop e6 is probably a, a fine defense. Um, I was looking also at playing queen e7 to prepare bishop e6. And not allow the structural damage. Something like this. Just take it, you know. B3 is a nice move there, solid move. To get Bishop A3 going. Bishop A3 is nice. I mean, White is just better here. He's got more space, and D6 is so weak. Bishop A3, Rook D1, Bishop, Knight, and Rook all to D6 at the same time. Dang, pretty scary stuff. <laughs> pretty scary stuff when your opponent has three pieces on one square. But also, F6 is weak. I mean, the dark squares are just pretty weak. There's no other way to put it. You also got to watch out for knight c5 coming at you, right? Got to watch out for knight c5. This is a positional advantage. No doubt about it. So knight orf, I'm sure, is pretty happy at this point. Um, either way. You know, whether he ruined the structure or, or not. Still, he takes it and plays e5. Cutting off that g7 bishop. But giving away the d5 square. So here comes the knight. So, so far, pretty normal stuff, huh? Clearly, white's better. Anybody would think that. But, um, Karis makes kind of a bad defense the next couple of moves. Yes? So, why did, um, why didn't he retreat the bishop on e3? Oh, he's allowing him to take it. I know. Yes. Um, that, that's absolutely true. Because it seems like a really important bishop since they have that all those dark squared weaknesses. And what do you mean here? Bishop. Yes, I was just kind of surprised by that. Yeah, that is an interesting point. But, um, well, let's discuss these pieces for a bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, that knight on d5 cannot be attacked at all by a white pawn. You know, it's pretty solid there. Mm -hmm. And right in the center... It's also putting a lot of pressure on white. Now it's true that I like bishops more than knights, but that knight is pretty good. This bishop is also blocked by his own pawns. On the king side, at least. On the queen side, it's free. Born free, as free as the wind blows. I think that later he could have retreated the bishop 
But uh, I would do something like move the rook and play bishop c1. You know, that's how I would do it. But you're right that potentially these dark squares could be weak. But he shut down this bishop. It's going to take a while for this bishop to get back in the game. He's going to have to play like rook up, bishop out, and then come over here and have the square defended sufficiently in order to punish your your dark square weakness. By then you could just play king h1, right? It's going to take one move to do that. It would be a good move. And I don't think he'd mind to play knight against bishop here with that knight on e4. Pretty good knight. Pretty good knight. But yeah, it's it's not clear. He could have retreated the bishop, definitely. He could have tried that. But he thinks it's just more efficient. Get the pieces in. If you want to trade away your good knight, you know, on your time, you know, that's up to you. And he didn't. He played b6. But I think he should have. Like you were saying. Something like this, even. Which, uh, if you trade on b6, he covers c5, which is kind of nice. You know, the pawn will cover the c5 square. If you play knight c5, your knight's pinned, so you can't take the e-pawn. So I sort of uh, covered covered everything for now, and this pawn is also under a little pressure. But still, white's definitely better. White's definitely better here. I mean, the structure is just better, and the minor piece is better. And the control of the center is better. Everything's better. That's why he didn't mind you to take it. He just thought I'm better here, no matter what. I think he's absolutely right. Goes for b6. Stopping knight c5, or bishop c5, right? Rook a, d1. Like, here's a moment he could totally play bishop c1. Why not? Mm -hmm. Got his rook in, backed that bishop up. But he just wanted to play g3, didn't mind if you take it. You know, your knight's pretty good, too. I think that's fair. a3, just controlling the b4 square, stopping queen or knight to b4. Patient move there. And now I think that uh, Carries actually makes an irreparable mistake. He goes for an innocent looking move. Oh, here we go, yeah. Should play c5 as I noted, although white's doing very well there. Knight c7. Doesn't look too bad. But it allowed. Uh, who's, who are we talking about? Nidorf. <laughs> it allowed Nidorf's next move. Powerful move. Powerful positional move. The type of move Nidorf would love to play. Any candidates? Rook d6. Rook d6. Knight c7. It allowed rook d6, right? Knight d6. And, knight d6. Which already could have been played. Rook d6 is pretty forcing, though. It threatens the c-pawn. And puts pressure on the e-pawn, which is pretty weak. Yeah. Nice move. Really strong move there, rook d6. And now, Keres has got to be sweating it out at this point, I would imagine. Anybody would be. And there's a tactical trick that he actually misses here. Check this one out. Goes for uh, c5. He's like strategically lost if he plays queen e8 there, but now it's a tactical shot. See if you guys will let you think about it for a minute or so. Find the tactic here. Complicated stuff here. Mm -hmm. Even I'm not sure about variation when I was calculating it. Not gonna lie. But Kira's wouldn't fall for something so easy. So, you know, gotta try. Can't promise to try, but I'll try to try. 
Any suggestions for White? It's tactics time. Where's your tactics hat? Make a threat. Maybe capture somebody. Deliver a check. Anything's possible when it's tactics. But you got children and they're not even telling me the tactics and they're kids. You're supposed to tell me the tactic when you're a kid. Not sure? I'll give you a hint. He prepared for a skewer. Prepared for a skewer. He wants to skewer, but he can't skewer right now. So he set that skewer up. So oh, he I could skewer. What? F5. Oh. Is that what you're going to say? No. Or what did you have for me? Uh, Terrible. Oh, sorry. What was it? <laughs> <laughs> Got her. Yeah, that was bad. Well, if it's not F5, it's not right. Oh, okay. F5. Bishop G5. Oh, I was looking at the game. I was wrong. Yes, that's what oh, a skewer yeah. is all about. And also, it's Fork Town if you're not careful. Mm. You don't want to walk in a Fork Town. They don't take kindly to free bishops in Forkton. So, it's actually uh, too bad for Karius. There's not really a great defense. He played EF. I was thinking about Bishop E5 here. Yeah, I was looking at that. I was about to ask why not. But it's Bishop G5. It's a G-Force game already. Can you see that up there? Yeah. <laughs> Come on, stop telling me that. Every time I try to install it, it's like, you want to sign up for G4? Shut up. <laughs> yeah, but it's Bishop G5 still, right? Bishop takes E5, Bishop G5. It looks like you're getting ready to RIP. Queen F7, Rook takes D8. Free Rook. You know, I use my Rook to take, and my Bishop's there, and your Queen's over here, so... And then I say, save my rook. Yeah, it has to be bishop g5 still. Who would have thought? <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, f5, bishop g5. Really nice tactic by Nidor. That's how you gotta put him away, though. Takes here. You know the move. This happened. Freebie. And then here comes, uh, this. You have more than one win here, but... Boom shakalaka. Really good stuff by Nidorf there. Love that move. That's the move you want to see. When you're calculating. In your head, you know? When Nidorf saw that move, he's like, oh yeah, that's the move. Mm -hmm. Great move. Resigns. Best move by Karaz there. Definitely. There's no other move. Have to resign. <clears throat> so, the deal is, uh, you know, if you play, for example, bishop takes, it'll be knight takes check, and then we'll just take on e6, like with our rook or whatever, after queen takes. Also, the queen's hanging. Did you have a question? No. Oh, okay, it kind of seemed like it. So, yeah, a nice tactical end there. I mean, he didn't even have to play that move, honestly, but really good stuff with f5, bishop g5. He really got it done there. And Karaz played kind of passively that game and let um, Nidorf build up a nice position, even though he got a lot of material off the board. There's only two minor pieces each, but that was enough to get some tactics erupting, as we saw. With more space and a better structure, you can squeeze that kind of position, and Nidorf uh, didn't mind to win it that way. So let's go on to the next one, huh? Oh, no save. All right, yeah, this next one here, it's Nidorf beating up on old Spassky. Boris Spassky. Um, I wanted to show some ones where he beats some, you know, some big dogs, and they don't get much bigger or doglier than Spassky, do they? This game was 1955. Question? Was no, we just invented it. Oh, okay. In 2019. 
Yeah. September. <laughs> All right, so we got here a uh, Fiancato variation of, of a King's Indian. And with black, Spassky here plays a really modern way with bishop f5. Probably Spassky was just like, oh, I'll do that, you know, I'll show him. He won't know what to do here. No, I don't know. <laughs> but I don't really know what the theory 1955 King's Indian was. I would assume that they didn't really play this. But maybe. Well, bishop f5 is even played today. Uh, I remember Ding Liren played this once. Um, it was years ago, maybe 2013, something like that. And, yeah, I've seen it. I've even played it myself. I played it against uh, an honorary Grandmaster, Grandmaster Ken West. <laughs> Who, he uh, lived up to his honorary title by playing Bishop F4. Which is a pretty dumb move, I will say. Pretty dumb. But, yeah, Bishop F5 is nice. The point is to play Knight E4. And to put your white square bishop for black on E4 and challenge... White's white square bishop on g2. Or even just trade him. Whatever. Whatever he wants. And they play the opening pretty nicely here. If you're wondering at home the most aggressive way for white to go, it's probably d5. But he goes for b3. Not a bad move. Probably the second best move, really. We should have seen this coming. There. Takes, takes. And like I said, what does black do here? I mentioned it, but I mentioned a lot of stuff, so maybe... You don't even know what black should do here, huh? Anyone? Come on, you gotta listen to all my ramblings. How are you gonna learn? Bishop e4, challenge that g2 bishop. Yeah, black doesn't mind to trade off the bishops here. He's got less space, because he played the king's Indian defense. So you get less space then. And trading off the bishop would also weaken the white squares around the king. For white. And not really weaken anything for black. So, yeah, let's go for it. Bishop e4. Rook c1. I think queen d2 is more common, but rook c1 looks fine to me. And d5. Solid play here. Absolutely correct. e3. And now, Spassky correctly starts to aim for his next pawn break. What is Spassky... Well, what is Bosky's next pawn break? What should he be going for? Black to play here. Do you see that arrow? E5 would be a pretty typical looking pawn break, right? I don't know about F6. It looks a little weak of the, for the white squares. Maybe, though. Maybe F6, E5. I feel like if you played F6, E5, you could totally get away with it, right? You might end up with an isolated pawn. Like, imagine I take and you play F takes, right? You, you imagining it? Yeah. And then I play this to capture. You get an isolated e pawn, right? Oh. So I, I think I'd be a little better there, minimum. Do you think? Minimum, a little better. Not to mention the weak king that you weakened. But still, I feel like if you went for f6, e5, maybe it'd be a little worse. It wouldn't be too bad. Playing with a plan is the way to go. And a pawn break is definitely called for here. But you might be able to tell that Spassky's abandoned the traditional e5 pawn break. Because he actually played d6, then from d6 to d5 with the pawn. Weakening e5. He doesn't even care about e5 anymore. He's breaking here. He's going to break on a4. That's what his next pawn break was. Activating his a8 rook. And also with this a4 pawn break, he's going to capture on b3. And then secure that b4 square for the knight in the future. If there is no a pawn, the knight on b4 will never be attacked by a pawn. Okay. <clears throat> I, can't I can't look at this position and I would have no idea that was the pawn break. I was going to mm -hmm. suggest a6, b5 <laughs> and try to get the c file opened up. So. Yeah, but that would help white if you opened up the c file. Yeah, I know, but I just 
wasn't really imagining opening up the other side. The A file is what he wants for this rook. You want to open up for your opponent's rook, he wants to open up for his rook. You know, that's all. But yeah, you could look at all of those pawn breaks. E5, B5, probably C5 would be tough to imagine <laughs> getting that in. I mean, I guess that would be the, the most preferred one if you could, but there's a knight there. So mm -hmm. A4 is what he goes for. Okay. And it's a absolutely correct. But those are all your options, so got to look at them. It's not clear which one's the best till you analyze it a bit. But A4 definitely is, uh, is pretty smart stuff there. Or A A5, I mean, of course. It's pretty smart stuff there. Queen e2, solid improving move there. e6, I don't know if that's entirely necessary, but whatever. Right? Looks okay. Can't hurt too much, right? Weakens the dark squares a little. Finally gets an a4. Just trying to activate his rook. Always do that. But there is a, an obvious reason why he played bishop f1. Right, Oliver? No. <laughs> he wants to move his knight, but not trade the bishops. He wants to move his knight away and kick your white squared bishop, even maybe trap it. If I could play knight e1 and f3, your white squared bishop's getting trapped for black. And you're going to have to uh, give it up or move a pawn or something on your king side, which is what ends up happening, actually. So bishop f1, nice, slow, patient play here by knight orf. You know, he's not above taking his time. Like I said, he wasn't all about... Hacking and slashing. Chop that meat. Great song. A takes B3. A takes B3. Improves the queen's position. And does back it up. Like I said, preparing to uh, trap the white square bishop. Threatening to win it even right now. If it's white's turn, white wins the bishop. So he prevents it by moving his h-pawn. Also playing g5 I think is interesting too to prepare bishop g6. But h5 to control g4 is also fine. So he doesn't even play f3 because he can't follow up with g4 now. Well he could, right? He could play f3 and then g4. But once I take it and you take back, this square becomes open because you don't have an f-pawn anymore. You guys see what I'm saying there? So that's why he played h5 to save his bishop. That's how it saves the bishop at least. Knight back up to d3. I like that uh, Nidorf is so flexible here. Much like the opening, the Nidorf, right? The Sicilian Nidorf, very flexible opening. And here he's very flexible as well. He's got all of his pieces behind his, his pawns. So you can push any pawn and make several pawn breaks. You can see him breaking on g4 or e4 or even on the queen side later in the game. With uh, He's got a lot of options, that's all. He's got all these options. Goes for, uh, he sort of breaks equilibrium here, does Spassky. Um But I think that actually Miguel didn't, didn't punish him. Let's see what he did. I give a couple of options here, Queen F6 or Rook A7, I think are normal moves. But he played DC. What do you think Nidorf should play here? FC? You mean BC? Oh yeah. Why would you think F is next to C? What kind of alphabet is that? <laughs> yeah, BC, that would be the normal move. Do you think I would ask you about that? Yes, BC correct, Oliver. Gold star. He recaptured the pot. You know, come on. Try to think outside the box. What other option could white have? Careful, though. Your knight's attacked. Maybe like C5? Now you're talking, finding some forcing moves. That's what I'm looking at. A really strong move, Knight C5. That would have been better than recapturing, actually. I wonder if he um, considered it or just sort of quickly recaptured, which is what he did. He recaptured. Not the best. Knight C5 is kind of nice. The idea is if you move back, I'll actually take with the Queen. I think that even if he did consider knight c5, he probably wouldn't think to play queen takes. But this is a really aggressive way to play, to get the queen in and actually start to target the c7 pawn. It's kind of hard to imagine, but 
boom. You could try to break with e4 and d5, forcing the knight away. This, the b pawn's also weak. These bishops will be traded if that happens, potentially. And the c-file can open up, and the c-pawn's weak as well. I mean, he's threatening knight takes b7 here, and if you protect it, I can even still take knight takes b7, rook takes b7, queen c6. So you got to watch out for tactics already for black. And uh, this would have actually been the strongest way to play for the initiative. Pretty uh, interesting stuff, though. I think normally you would just recapture, right? Keep your pawns all together. Control all the control the fifth rank there with the C and D pawns. It looks really nice. It looks really nice. So okay, didn't really punish him, but still white's looking great. You know, still white's looking great. Although um, he was so panicked about knight c5 that he ended up giving away a concession here. Oh, you hate to see it. You hate to see him giving up the bishop pair. Obviously, Spassky knows the bishop pair is pretty good. He just didn't want to play b6. He just didn't want to do it. He didn't want to encourage the guy to break here. He didn't want to weaken his knight. And his pawn. And the white squares. That's all kind of long-term stuff as well as giving up the bishop pair. So it is a tough decision. You know, he's, he's worse here. He's probably even close to losing here. White has a better pawn structure and more space and two bishops. Really nice. Nidorf loves all these advantages. He's like, give me all these advantages. This is not a King's Indian player's dream, I would say. Work A7, he does play that move that I mentioned earlier. <coughs> Defending the weak B pawn as well as getting ready to double it up. Queen B1, interesting move there. Flexible move, much in Nidorf style, I would say. And then goes back with the bishop. Yeah, that white square bishop is a monster now, because he traded away his own white square bishop, remember? Really strong bishop on g2. Knight d8. Pokes it. Yeah, gets the queen in here. Tries to get some counterplay on the queen side. Um, reasonable idea, I would say. Consistent. And I think that he definitely, Nidorf could have kept improving here, but he finally actually made a break. A permanent change here with d5. That's the break that he was aiming for the whole time. Absolutely. Very logical play. Like I always say, they're aiming for those pawn breaks in the middle game. Everything's pointing towards d5 here. Good play all around. Takes it. Wasn't forced, but not so bad, I think. Pokes the rook. I think just to get him off of this, right? Yeah. Back here. Yeah, maybe bishop g7 was better because here uh, he sort of gets a tempo to hit the bishop. Then he goes back to g7. Well, I thought he should push with e4, but he went for queen g5. Not, not a bad move. White's position is so nice here. All this space in the center. The two bishops look really nice. The knight on d8 is a joke. But black does have a pretty good rook on a2. Bishop on g7 is not bad either. Now he's still in it. He's still in it, but... The queen side is really bad here for black. The two pawns on the queen side look pretty vulnerable, I would say. I would, I would uh, be very pessimistic with black, personally. Goes for rook 8, a6, yeah. Now, if I had white, I would be, like, avoiding a queen trade. I looked at queen g4 and queen e7 to avoid it. Queen f5 to attack the pawn on f2. Bishop e1, gotta love that move. Love bishop e1. And then, uh, trying to trade the queens again. I said, no, thank you. It's just a variation I was looking at, you know. But I think that either way, white keeps the two bishops, white keeps the space advantage, and as long as white doesn't have to give up any concession, it should be on its way to a technical win with all these advantages. But, like I was saying, I'm trying to avoid a queen trade, but I in the game, he played here and then immediately was met by queen e7, which I thought was surprising to trade the queens here, but 
He really likes the bishop pair in the endgame. And uh, I can't say I blame him. Also, the queen on d7 is doing really good guard duty there, defending on the 7th rank everything. Yes? Why couldn't you do bishop e 7 and attack the knight in pawn? Oh, I see what you... Uh, discovered attack the b-pawn. Yeah, that's absolutely a, a, a viable option, but... Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, he would think about that move. And I'm sure he was thinking about that move, actually. But Spassky prevented it. Spassky made it so you probably won't play bishop e7. Because there's a tactical problem with it. With his last move, he prepared f6. See what I mean? Prepared f6 by protecting it with the rook. Discoordinating your queen and bishop. And then you're going to lose your bishop. Or your queen. But that was a good one. That was a good question. So he goes for queen e7 instead. Trades it away. Knight's hanging. So he goes for uh, bishop f6. This actually is a tactical blunder. But it would look kind of silly for him to play rook back to a8 after he just played rook a6. But Spassky could justify this by saying, at least uh, I got the queens off the board. Sure, I moved my rook up and down, but got the queens off the board. That's what I would say <laughs> to justify it. But yeah, the knight on d8 is obviously garbage, and uh, that's really hurting black's chances in this to defend this endgame. And the b7 pawn is still weak, like I said, and c7's weak. Instead, he plays bishop f6, tactical blunder. Let's see if anybody could possibly find the winning move here. No one. I just kind of sat down. No one at all. <laughs> Come on, she just sat down. Can I give her a second before I call on you? Jeez. What about Oliver? <laughs> all right, what do you think with the wrong answer? D6. Interference. Really nice move there, D6. Absolutely. Bingo. What's his name -o? Very good move. Forcing move. Threatening this bishop for free now. Because we discoordinated. Whoop. You know? The rook on the sixth rank interfered with that. And uh, that's going to attack the bishop. Now. It's pretty clear that trading bishops is not going to be acceptable, right? You take and takes back. It's like a queen by force already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that happens a lot when the knight's on the back rank, right? And you're attacking it with a pawn. They can't even stop you from queening. Classic knights. So he goes for uh, this. Now how do you win the most amount of material? Yes? Rook takes d6. Rook takes d6, winning the exchange. Bishop takes e7. Yeah, I won't take back. Well, I sort of will, but not what you just took. Yes? Bishop takes f6. Bingo. Dang, Oliver. Bishop takes f6, because the rook is pinned. Oh, I still moved it. And lost the knight. So at the end, it was the knight. That brought down the kingdom. Poetic. And then it's uh, basically a clean up job here. Free pawn. Fork. <laughs> so he resigned. But he's definitely going to lose down a piece anyway. Great game by Nightorf there. Um, in these games they were really positional. But then some tactics erupted after he had a good position. It was just outplaying the guy. And they had to find really good defenses to uh, to avoid it, but um, but they didn't, and he punished them for it. I don't really have time for the next game against Fisher. Dang, that that was a pretty good one too. But um, well, he beat Fisher, so <laughs> that's all you need to know. Come on, that's pretty good. Every time it is a great players of the past, if they beat Fisher, you see him beating Fisher. So come on. <laughs> Anyways, that's all I have for you today. Uh, if you enjoyed, please consider to like and subscribe to the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of Atlanta's YouTube channel. Thanks. Bye-bye.